Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, our seventh in the series of COVID-19 updates uh, for uh, our uh, PHN. Uh, firstly, can I welcome you to this evening's event and uh, start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. Um, tonight, we've got a range of speakers from a variety of uh, settings, including uh, Dr. Damien Wellborn and Dr. Sarah Bailey from the Raymond Terrace Clinic, uh, Dr. Karen Douglas from Terrigal Voca Medical Centre, uh, Dr. Kat Taylor from Hunter New England uh, Public Health Unit, Dr. Catherine Todd from the Public Health Unit at the Central Coast, and Dr. John Ferguson, who's an infectious diseases physician here at Hunter New England. We'll also hear this evening from uh, Marika McKenzie and or Sandra Fitzgerald uh, around health pathways. Um, can I just ask you if you've got questions to uh, log in to Slido and the code for this evening is uh, PHN7, so that's PHN7. Uh, just by way of a uh, quick update, I thought I'd uh, just provide some information on a couple of things. Uh, the first one being the distribution of masks. Um, the primary health network here in the Hunter, New England and Central Coast area has distributed to date 177,550 masks to primary care clinicians across our footprint. Those masks include masks from the national stockpile and those from uh, which were donated by uh, the NIB uh, organisation and from uh, SHAPE, uh, the Chinese uh, um, uh, Society of uh, Health Professionals. I'd also like to just provide a little bit of an update on community respiratory clinics, uh, let people know that we have clinics, uh, Commonwealth funded clinics operating at Arena, Raymond Terrace, and we'll hear from Damien and Sarah shortly. We also have a clinic in Tamworth and a, a clinic in Moree at uh, Pius the 10th there. We soon hope to have a mobile clinic uh, located in the western part of our region operating uh, from Gunnedah round through to Narrabri and, and other parts of the western part of our region. And finally, we're in the final stages of uh, establishing a, a community respiratory clinic in Taru. So again, can I just remind you to post your questions on Slido. The code for Slido is PHN7. Uh, and we'll kick off by hearing from Dr. Damien Wellborn and Dr. Sarah Bailey from Raymond Terrace Family Practice. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Um, so this is just going to be a little bit of a discussion about um, how we came to be operating a GP respiratory clinic at Raymond Terrace. I'm sure that a lot of the people watching will see some common threads with their own experiences as this whole thing has unfolded. For us, it sort of started back late January when we were watching all of the media about things unfolding overseas and recognising that if this thing came here, we were going to be facing some cases and we needed to be ready for it. Lots of different thoughts and emotions go through your head when you're looking at that. You think, <laughs> should we just run and hide and pop up when it's gone away? Um, should we take it on? Um, we for those that don't know us, are in a community that's fairly geographically discreet. We've got floodplains between us and Newcastle and Maitland, so it's a fairly self-contained town and a fairly large sort of low socioeconomic demographic up there as well. Um, we decided that uh, if it came to our town, we'd inevitably end up seeing cases arriving at our clinic uh, and that we needed to be prepared for it. So um, uh, we thought that... Um, we needed to create a space that would be safe to see people that thought they might have COVID or indeed that did have COVID and had a need for a GP consult. Um, and we had the good fortune that our clinic really allowed itself to, um, to be modified for that. So we've got a very long corridor with 14 consulting rooms along it and our main entrance at one end of it and uh, a, an emergency fire escape at the other end, which was fairly readily modified into a wheelchair accessible proper, proper entry to a clinic. So um, we were lucky in that regard. And we also were pretty lucky, weren't we, with um, getting some collaboration, cooperation from local authorities. So uh, an obvious thing we needed was um, a parking area and somewhere for patients to wait out there. And the council, Port Stephens Council, uh, reflowed the street at the back of our building to one way and made front to curb parking right outside our door for us. And 
They did yeah. that very quickly, like yeah. within two days of us asking, which is quite remarkable. Mm. I think yeah. the communication and assistance from that was fantastic. Mm. Yeah, so um, along the way we'd sort of thought about other things that we needed to do. Obviously, um, fairly strong screening to make sure that anybody that was potentially COVID positive was um, diverted elsewhere if they were very sick, um, kept at home if they were quite mild and able to be assessed by us if there was a need for it. So like a lot of other practices, we pivoted over to doing mainly telehealth. Um, we had lots of time with our admin staff asking questions of absolutely everybody about overseas travel and contact with cases and all of those things. And I think that's pretty standard across general practices everywhere that people are doing that. Um, and we tried to work out alternative models. Should we do it in an after hours space? Should we do it um, by judicious use of home visits? Or should we just see the sick people in the car park and not bring them in the building at all? Um, but yes, recognising that if this was to unfold over many months, there'd be some patients that would say the hospital's too risky to go or the hospital system's just completely overwhelmed and they, they're not going to go there. And uh, as I said earlier, we just anticipated uh, the inevitability of people showing up on our doorstep. So um, to keep ahead of that, one of our forward-thinking doctors, Liz Keiko, managed in late January to procure us a heap of PPE. So we started off pretty well stocked, um, which was good for us. Uh, and then we started making those changes to our room. So we um, stripped everything out of a couple of rooms down the back near the rear entrance so that we could just wipe over surfaces. So we stripped them back basically to just a, a chair and a desk um, and some basic equipment like a stethoscope and thermometer and things um, and created that rear, rear access with the parking there. And we started to speak to the, um, the building, mm. the um, Hunter New England, to see what they would be thinking they wanted to do, mm. didn't they? Yeah, so alongside this, we are co-located in a building that's owned by New South Wales Health and it's got the, the Community Health Centre is located in our same building. We have just over just about a quarter Order. of the building yeah. um, by floor area. And so we were having discussions with LHD about whether or not we should do a drive-through swabbing thing in the car park and we'd actually advanced that model a fair way when, when they realised that actually um, maybe there'd be another option, which is a Commonwealth-funded clinic. Um, so they sort of cooled a little bit once they found that we might get some funding to do something ourselves. And in fact, the communication and negotiation with the with health was uh, interesting all the way along because uh, being their tenant and wanting to cut holes in their walls to create negative pressure rooms was um, a little bit difficult. So they were pretty resistive and not at all nimble at first when we wanted to come in and put in uh, ventilation to improve um, our secure safety. And in fact, we also, I mean, mainly the ventilation was also to improve confidence for people working in the building that we weren't recirculating COVID through the air conditioner and for patients so that they would still confidently come to the uh, main part of the practice and not be worried about things. So, um, But we did manage to get some um, exhaust fans put in. So we've now got three rooms that are negative pressure rooms. They change the air every three and a half minutes to the outside, draw in from the corridor. Um, and whilst it's not, um, what we're doing is not seeing uh, aerosol or airborne um, COVID, um, it still gives some reassurance to people where they're coming to work there that we've done as best we can in the circumstances. And Hunter New England came along at, at that point, once we once we getting the contract together, they started to help with the entry and the um, dividing off our clinic with a glass door, which has given our patients a lot more confidence. When you walk into our corridor, there's a visible divide between COVID clinic, which they're a bit scared of, and our clinic. So it's actually yeah. been a really useful, and at first we went, oh, it's an ugly door in the middle, but it's a nice glass door that shows activity in that end yeah. but that it's divided yeah from the main part of our practice actually now as you walk walk in you can see through the glass partition door people bustling about in gowns and masks <laughs> and things it all looks very you know covidy down there yeah, it does. <laughs> and uh hopefully they're, they're feeling safe at the other end and in fact you know one of our main motivators for starting all of this was so that we could continue business as usual as much as possible in the front end of the building seeing people in person having people not sit on stuff and not come to the doctor because they were fearful that they might catch something nasty at the doctors. And also for our staff. Yeah. We wanted our staff to be able to come to work with confidence that it was a safe place to be. In particular, a number of our doctors have got some health conditions and a couple yeah. are pregnant and they were um, needing to be looked after. So we still have well. four that are doing telehealth and that we have a few others that are doing a mix now and I can talk about that as we talk about the front of house mm. later on. But it actually was a really big part of the journey of as it all unfold, uh, evolved and we learnt more <coughs> from the, these kind of evenings about um, confidence and PPE and that type of stuff. It really helped, I think, with the staff, the admin and the mm. doctors and for us to have that availability to have a safe end. So we didn't have doctors that wouldn't come. They all came 
they all work with us, mm. um, but there's actually a, a, an area that we can bring our elderly patients in that we feel safe in. That's right. Now, our doctors that um, need to just do purely telehealth still come to the building yeah, they do. and work from the building, which is great because they're still part of the team. They've still yeah. got that peer support and it's been a really wonderful thing actually having them there. It's been really good. Yeah, so along the way, fairly early in the piece, um, we were in touch with the PHN and discovered these uh, contracts for the GP respiratory clinics. Uh, our model that we're already sort of well advanced with doing really met their criteria pretty well, and so um, that was a pretty good match. I think that our location and demographic we service probably also helped a little bit. Uh, so we started along um, looking to see whether or not we should kick off and sign a contract. With the intention that if we didn't sign a contract, we'd do it anyway, but yep. probably on a limited base just, basis just for our own patients. And of course, with the contract, then we'd see a much broader group of people. Yep. We had to see you know, if we could service that group of people. Um, a couple of good motivators along there were uh, that we would be assured of an access to PPE through the national stockpile. That's part of the contract, and that was something that was important to us. If we are going to see people and being assured that we'd be able to do it safely, um, was, was a good thing, so that was a motiv um, motivator. And of course, uh, keeping the revenue stream flowing at a time when we'd pivoted over to doing half-price telehealth consults and not that many of them, and things were looking a bit dire in mid-March financially. So uh, that hasn't panned out as we'd expected either. No, it's been more, great. More info from Sarah, yeah. but um, <clears throat> that was certainly something which motivated us to go down that track in the first place. So at the beginning of April, we'd ticked all the boxes for the contract yeah. and signed and executed a contract with the Commonwealth. Then we had an agonising period of time while we had to go through credentialing and signing off and training. And then we finally started doing services from our respiratory clinic in, uh, on the 9th of 9th April. So it's April. been five weeks now. I have to say that uh, we'd gone in expecting that we would be assessing people for, um, with respiratory conditions and treating them and seeing people and deciding if they were sick enough to go to hospital or stay at home, so probably seeing COVID positive things. And the contract from the Commonwealth was a surprisingly narrow remit, really. They would do want us to do an assessment, and we do that, um, to take a sample where indicated, and we do that as well. But then there's not really any provision for seeing them again or following them up. And if they are COVID positive, there's, there's uh, nothing in the contract for looking after those. So going forward, if we do see an outbreak, we'd have to work out ways of um, you know, privately billing those patients if they to come through our clinic. But the nice thing is that we have that actually set up. Yeah, it's ready to room, go. So That's ready. right. Um, so over the five weeks, we've seen a steady build in traffic through our clinic. Um, we started out on day one, I think we saw two patients. Yep. Um, yesterday, we saw 61. Um, we've sort of settled into a groove of probably about 50 to 55 a day, and every appointment we open up just fills. It's quite um, interesting, On the actually. day, yeah, as it happens. Kind of, yeah. you, you have an extra doctor that's available, and you open the afternoon thinking, oh, normal practice, mm. if you had an empty doctor in the morning, you'd be a bit worried that they wouldn't fill. Um, but it's been quite remarkable to sit there and watch them fill um, from the call line, from other GPs, um, us helping other GPs. It's actually really nice to see the variety that's coming through the clinic. That's right. So, um, and referrals to the clinic is an interesting thing. So um, fairly early on we saw lots of GP referrals, didn't we, yeah, for people yeah. that didn't have the means to be able to see them in their own clinics and they would uh, refer them down. And we're and still they, getting some of those. And they had much those. stricter testing criteria at that point. So as the as it opened yeah. up to respiratory illness, it was much easier for us to advertise on Facebook and to say, respiratory illness needing assessment, see a doctor, that's an easier yeah, that's one. Right, yeah. Whereas before it was more GP-led, wasn't it yeah. really? And, um, and we've sort of flexibly gone with the flow there, haven't we? I mean, yeah. um, we expected that we'd be seeing um, lots more um, COVID around us than we have. In fact, we've seen yeah. basically none. <laughs> um, and now uh, we're sort of helping with the effort to um, do surveillance and screening and early detection of any cases yeah. so we can keep it clamped down and that's probably where it's at now. And then of course if things change we'll then we'll be back to um, you know, assessing and managing and helping to triage and sort people and manage people outside yeah. the hospital system that are, that are suitable for that. And yeah. I think that the key thing that Damien's been talking about through that whole pro process I think was communication, mm. particularly for our staff. Um, so we started very early on trying to work out we've got 13 doctors and a whole lot of admin, a whole lot of nurses, how do they actually communicate mm. between each other we, we started doing little meetings that Damien and I were basically there most days. So we try to speak to the staff individually, try to keep them up. It was a very yeah. fluid environment. Um, we moved quite quickly to doing a group chat and email train for them all. Um, but in the last few minutes, we thought we'd talk about how it's affected the front of house. Mm -hmm. um, so talking about, so Damien referred to the revenue drop that we saw at the beginning. So in March when we looked at it, we went, wow, we'll qualify for the job keeper at the rate we're going because we'd actually seen 
tele, that it was telehealth that was only, there was no rebates for chronic disease and stuff. As you all know, that's improved and we've actually, um, the workflow has changed and morphed into that, but our admin staff have been really busy. So particularly with the flu vax um, season coming along, and one of our challenges was that we really wanted people to, to feel safe, but we also wanted to keep the vulnerable out of the waiting room. Um, being part of a Hunt New England building, we've also got a screening station at the front where they take temperatures, so it slows in the, the, the walking through mm. the clinic is actually quite slow. So our traditional flu vax clinic didn't, wasn't going to work. Um, so we decided we'd try with it to do a flu vax drive-through clinic, which actually took a little bit more work than, than at first thought. Um, we, we went to the bowling club next door that was closed down and asked them if we could use their car parking area that has a really nice solar panel that goes about five car lengths long that gave us protection from the sun and from the rain um, with good ex a good explanation, particularly to the old drivers, to drive down that way and to not run us over. We've managed to yeah. mark it out quite well. <coughs> um, and then do systems, which is what you guys are all really good at, but systems of actually having a trolley that has the right kind of esky with the monitoring of the vaccine so that we've got the right vaccines there because we're a few minutes from the clinic. Not very minutes, we're just the yeah, car park short outside. Walk. Short yeah. walk, but still, we needed you know anaphylaxis kit. We had a nurse, a doctor. It's actually been really nice. The patients have really appreciated the fact that they get to talk to us a little bit more. We were able to talk to them about isolation, about the fact that they were supposed to be isolating through these times and that we then could do flu vaxes and actually ha they were really appreciative. So we found it a really positive thing. Yeah, I have to say I've been jealous. They've been outside in the beautiful weather and seeing patients having a chat and I've been, I've been behind a mask and a gown and a visor swabbing people. He's doing one on Thursday though. <laughs> My first one. I'm looking forward to it. That's so I think that was the, the main things. I think we're running out of time now. Yeah, but um, what were the other things that... So we've got time for questions later, yeah. so I'd encourage the audience to have a think about the questions they might want to ask. Uh, use Slido, uh, yeah. and, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. So now, uh, just a slight uh, change of presenter. We're going to hear from Dr Karen Douglas. Uh, Karen is a GP on the Central Coast here in our footprint and uh, from Terrigal and Avoca Beach Medical Centres. Karen is also Chair of the Clinical Council for the Central Coast and we're going to hear about a general practice perspective uh, of operating a respiratory clinic. Over to you, Karen. Karen, I don't think your mic's turned on. Sorry. How's that? I'll just start Perfect. again. Can you hear me there, John? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for having me and uh, thank you very much to Damien and Sarah for sharing um, your uh, terrific work that you have done up in Raymond Terrace. Uh, of course, our practice is, uh, is a little different on the beaches of the Central Coast and Central Coast is very different to... Hunter and New England. I'm going to just take you through a little uh, journey through our practice and I've also had some input from uh, some wonderful GPs on the Central Coast who have actually given me uh, some insight into what they're doing. So I'm actually going to show you a um, PowerPoint presentation now and I'll just take you through this. Okay, so thank you, John, for um, introducing me. So I'm not going to introduce myself again. But uh, for those who haven't seen it, this is our pretty bug. This is the biggest bugbear we've had this year. Although those who have been caught up in the fires and the floods and the rains and the droughts understand that there's lots of other issues that have been facing our communities and definitely in general practice. Um, I guess this bug actually produced what I called the disorganised and disorganised chaos for all of us worldwide. One bright thing that's been happening every morning is that we've actually had a beautiful COVID sunrise. Um, the, the days, we've been very lucky really since uh, COVID has hit Australia that we've actually experienced some beautiful weather 
And now I'm just, just showing you what um, shines over our practice every day. So how has COVID-19 affected us and general practice on the Central Coast? Well, we've, I guess I look at it in a number of ways, actually how it's affected our practice and what the concept of general practice actually is. I guess very importantly, how it's affected our staff, our doctors, our practice managers, our receptionists, nurses, and other staff members who work with us. How it's affected our patients. I mean, the anxiety and the fear of the unknown has been just such a huge problem for all of us. And we know that the neglect of chronic disease, anxiety um, has been a problem. And many of us have actually had many volunteers we have other contractors and cleaners in our practices and how that ha has affected us. And I guess a practice as a business, for those of us who actually own the businesses, um, what's actually what we've been facing. And I guess some of the big issues really in, um, in what COVID's done to us, um, our major observations is that COVID's here to stay. Um, general practice has definitely changed. It's not probably not going to go back to what it was before. We were very unprepared, underprepared, and that this pandemic has definitely shown us that general practice is often very reactive. And if, if nothing else, I think we need to actually start being proactive and work much better together so that we have got systems in place. Because each of us have often been working as islands to actually get through this crisis. Um, we've all been fueled by that adrenaline rush that really happened in, uh, in probably early March, um, watching what was happening in the rest of the world. And suddenly general practice was just taken um, along so fast. So I guess the major outcomes that, we, that we've actually had really in practice uh, is that we've had to look after our, GP, our um, patients. We've, we've really gone to uh, telehealth, paper handling's become a nightmare phone triage and phone calls, the number of phone calls in each practice has just been horrendous and how our staff have managed that is beyond us. We're just so thankful to such an amazing team. Management of urtis and potential COVID, so those who have got fever, vir uh, viral illness or urtis, even a sniffle and a sore throat, we're now told, really we need to treat them as if they're potential effective. And the biggest issue, of course, for everybody who's dealing with this in healthcare is, is the lack of PPE and how we had that problem. So we've really increased, in, improved our communication. We're treating everybody as being infected. And I guess, you know, we're now, all of us know about keeping our distance, washing our hands, looking after infection control, don't wash your face. Can't, I'd love to touch you, but I can't. Please take my, my air hugs. So the, the practice in, in general has been affected greatly. Um, originally it was quiet, and then it's become flat chat, and I'm sure most of us uh, know that. One of the really major um, outcomes from this, and I think the others have just uh, alluded to that, is the best time we've had with communication within practices. So we've been communicating incredibly well within our practice, um, our practice managers, our staff, and our number one concern for us was not just our community, but our staff and keeping them safe. So certainly identifying our staff as being potentially vulnerable. Um, we did have vulnerable doctors as we've got some older doctors in our practice. Um, we had some staff who couldn't continue to work in those first few weeks, but thankfully we've been able to accept them back in. Um, the phone calls that we've actually had have been unbelievable. If we just go back to that slide, this is what we got going in that early March to mid-March, and it was a sudden change to what, it, what our practice looked like inside. We were just pushed. Anxiety, that adrenaline, the fear of the unknown, the information overload that GPs actually had. We didn't have PPE. What clothes were we going to wear to work if we were going to come home infected and potentially take that home to our families? So we Many GPs across the land have actually gone into scrubs. We actually really enjoy it because we don't have much washing. We're definitely saving on washing powder. Um, but we didn't have too many gowns, caps, masks. So many of us have actually gone forward and produced some of our own. We've set up our own ERTI clinics, our flu vaccine clinics. We've been doing co some COVID swabbing. I'll tell you about that in a minute. 
We've also actually had to manage COVID positive patients in our practice. And I'll talk to you about that too. So here's just a couple of um, photos from our practice and a, and a practice up the road in Erina. Um, and all prepared we are. Here's some very troubled, but fun loving, beautiful staff. Um, the bottom picture here is actually my staff who have got the um, face shields. One, one word to one of our tent erectors every day. And the next day he had 40 um, face shields made for us. Here are the, uh, the, the beautiful uh, masks that have been made for our Erina um, GPs and our uh, fantastic scrubs and uh, gowns that were made for us by a wonderful, wonderful friend. Our patients have been very scared. They all think they've got COVID. They all think they're, they're going to get COVID and they think they're going to get COVID from us. So we have been very aware of how we've had to manage them. We've been aware of our vulnerable patients and then those in isolation and those who are lonely as well. Uh, the mental health we're probably all seeing across the land has just been absolutely exponential uh, due to probably the isolation with family, those who are actually dealing with relationship issues. This is just causing lots further problem. And certainly we know the under and unemployed are very, um, are very vulnerable as well. Flu vaccination time, and we've all been hit by the net necessity to keep our patients safe for that. And again, everything's COVID, everything's COVID. So we just keep talking about it. So general practice as a business has been really hit as well. And of course, the job keeper, job seeker, small business incentives. Many of us who are full-time GPs own our own practices and have really had the need to keep our staff and our doctors and our patients as safe as we can. So we've had to transfer our work, and our workload into very different ways of working. And of course, uh, telehealth is probably one of those biggest um, outcomes. Um, we had a reduction in patients initially in mid-March. We actually went to the phone very early, knew we didn't get, wouldn't get paid. But then as uh, the, the tsunami has hit, but thankfully not the COVID tsunami, but just the tsunami of those returning to practice and realising that they needed to contact their doctors, we've actually been doing a lot of telehealth. We've been doing a lot of telephone triage so that our staff have been taking the calls, making the appointment. All of our patients are triaged initially by a doctor to being well or, or having earthy symptoms. And those with earthy symptoms are actually taken out in the afternoon to our earthy tents and our, um, and our COVID swabbing. We have been swabbing all the time. Um, we've got a wonderful band of, um, uh, of uh, volunteers who are called for very early on a Facebook site of um, Friends of Evoca. I was inundated by people who wanted to help, help the vulnerable, help the isolated and help our practice. Um, these gentlemen have actually been wonderful in erecting and bringing that tent down every day. We've got a tent in the front car park and a tent in the back where we do our flu vaccinations in the front and our, our flu vac and our COVID and OTs in the back. I guess another big change has been um, how we communicate with our patients, as I've said, telehealth, We've put cameras on all our, our computers and so we can offer a video connection. Um, it's probably the, one of the largest single changes that we've actually made. We're actually, I oh, don't know about enjoyment, but we're actually moving there quite well. And we're now starting to see uh, pay, more patients come through. Being able to, of course, um, be able to uh, have a very good conversation with our patients and getting results. The welfare checks for our vulnerable, for our patients in community and our Aboriginal services who actually require um, more telephone uh, pickup. But it comes at a price. The equipment's not necessarily cheap and the time it takes to set these up. Now, this is our COVID clinic. We've actually had a uh, early tent going every day in the afternoon where we triage our patients. Um, we erect our tent. Uh, we put on our PPE and we do our swabbing. Above, you can see. Um, one of our other lovely doctors from Point Clare, who they have done a drive through clinic and a swabbing in the car. So we're lucky we have two practice sites. Um, we've kept a very, uh, one what we call a clean site and a clean practice area in our footprint inside and a dirty site, I guess, for Erties um, out the back. 
and we're allowing our patient flow to actually um, keep them well when they're well. Um, we've also assisted us in our vulnerable doctors and we've also been able to assist our, um, our um, residential aged care facilities by having some PPE to, to go through. Um, we've run our flu clinic. So above, you can see our flu clinic in the tent in the pouring rain. Um, this tent actually um, collapsed that day and these two got incredibly wet feet. We've been seeing up to 100 uh, people on a walkthrough clinic, which is outside the front door. And then the clinic from the Arano is an outside clinic that runs around the whole perimeter of their practice uh, from retrieval to exit. And these have been working amazingly well and across the country and certainly across the Central Coast, we've been doing drive-throughs, car park of practice, flu tents. But of course, our big issue with flu clinics and flu was the supply issues. I think most of us on the coast now are very, very happy with that. To get a, a clinic of 100 patients organised, can you imagine those number of phone calls, the number of texts that have gone to patients to actually rally them forth? But our patients are giving us amazing, amazing feedback. So I guess we're now supposedly on the road to recovery, as people tell us. The, I call it the awakening. Where are we going from now? Is it going to look more telehealth versus face-to-face? -face? How are we going to incorporate face-to-face -face back in? We're starting to let our patients back in. and But uh, again, after phone triage, our chronic disease management has probably fallen away, our screening, the health assessments. We've actually been doing some health assessments, but we couldn't bill them. So our uh, nurses have been contacting our elderly patients and doing the health assessments on the phone. And now they've gone back into their homes to just check on, and, on them with their welfare checks. I guess skin checks, what's going to happen to erdies and fever in the, in the future? And we're certainly going to need to keep ourselves um, well, our communities well, and um, our staff most particularly. Um, also, what are we going to do with the COVID positives? Our workforce is often um, struggling and are we going to have enough PPE? We actually have uh, screened and found a number of COVID patients in our practice um, very early on in the first couple of weeks of the potential tsunami. Um, all were well, thankfully, able to be managed at home with welfare checks from us. Took uh, public health a couple of days to be able to get to those people, and we were able to manage them in our practice. And they were all expected cases. These were people from overseas um, and the Ruby Princess. So, I guess our big issue that's facing general practice is let's not do this in silos, let's do, do this together, let's not reinvent the wheel, and let's try and actually work out what's going to, what's going to work for us. So, thank you to these lovely doctors and practices who have given me some feedback as to what we're doing on the coast. Um, I guess it says here that the end of stay at home orders doesn't mean the pandemic is over. It actually really means that there's actually room for all of us in ICU if we don't get sick together. So let's keep ourselves safe. And remember the sun goes down every day. So don't let the sun go down on your practice. Let's keep it happy and safe for everybody and our, pa and our patients and our staff particularly need to keep well. Thank you for your attention. Well, that was really great hearing that from you, Karen. So thank you. Um, the public health update from Hunter New England is going to be brief, but I just thought I'd share a couple of slides with you in terms of um, what the overview is looking like and um, some of the things that we're thinking about and working on now. Um, so this slide represents an infographic which has been developed by our wonderful data team. Um, and the intention of the infographic is that this is a sort of snapshot of what's been happening with COVID-19 in the Hunter New England area um, and it will be published on a weekly basis and there are you know some sections within it which will focus on confirmed cases um, and data within the previous seven days. So you'll get a bit of a sort of moving picture of what's happening with COVID which at the moment is not very much reassuringly. Um, so this data is current as of Sunday the 17th of May um, at which time there were 278 total cases in the Hunter. And I've presented previously on our sort of up and down with the peak sort of being at the end of March. Um, as I said previous, in a previous pre presentation, we haven't had any locally acquired cases with an unknown source for over a month now, which is really reassuring. 
Interestingly, we have had one new case notified in the last 24 hours, which I'll speak to a little bit more on a later slide. Um, but the idea of this infographic is just to give a bit of an overview of what's happening in the region um, and it uh, will be published on both the Hunter New England intranet and we'll find a home for it hopefully on the Health Pathways page as well. Um, there's some data there on testing as well. As you all know, it's all about test, test, test these days. Um, so you can see that in the Hunter New England area, there's been 47,853 COVID-19 tests conducted to date um, and very low positive positivity rate overall, but a 0% positivity rate over the past couple of weeks. Um, and you can see that that's been broken down by sector as well. You've got confirmed cases by sector, um, cases by source of exposure as well, and the distribution of um, age group and sex, which we think is probably more reflective of sort of the demographic of, for example, cruise ship travellers than necessarily the natural um, predisp predisposition of the virus itself. Um, and we're also providing a little bit of information there in terms of where people are being managed. Um, you can see that, you know, 270 people have been released from isolation. Sadly, four people have died. Um, and that there have been 32 that have been managed um, in an inpatient setting and 12 that have required intensive care. So that's just uh, a quick introduction to the COVID-19 Hunter New England infographic, which we're um, hoping to update on a weekly basis on Mondays. I'll just flick to the next slide. Oh, do I have that? I think I've got the power. Yes. Um, and so again, just a bit more of a granular look at testing. And so there's certainly been different pushes in different areas and it's been great to hear about the the work of the community respiratory clinics and I'd be really interested to hear Damien and Sarah if you've got um, any data on sort of the residents um, where your uh, people that are getting tested are coming from um, and also the age distribution as well which I'll uh, flick to you shortly uh, but you can see here the marked effect of the Tamworth drive-through clinic which ran for a couple of weeks and finished last week um, so that sort of orange-ish line, which has sort of shot up um, over the past couple of weeks is the Tamworth regional area, uh, largely as a result of, of that push with the drive-through clinic at Tamworth. Um, so that's that's been a fantastic effort. We, we think that, you know, there's there's good testing getting out to communities where, um, where it needs to be. As John mentioned, there are still some areas of under-testing. So the line in the middle reflects the Hunter New England average. So this isn't necessarily a target that we've set, um, but there are some uh, areas which are performing below that Hunter New England area. Um, and so there are um, efforts underway, both from a community respiratory clinic perspective and also from an LHD um, coronavirus testing clinic perspective to increase testing in for example, the Gunnedah um, and Inverell areas. So a lot of work happening in that space now. And just moving on, um, focusing in on one of the recent drives. So this was the stadium screening that happened um, at the McDonald Jones Stadium uh, over the past week or 10 days. So that ran sort of from just before Mother's Day weekend and wrapped up on Sunday. And this is just a breakdown of the people that were tested at that clinic, it was um, well over 7,000 tests um, that were conducted in total. Um, and at its height, I think there were 900 tests that were conducted in a day. But you can see that there is a bit of discrepancy between males and females getting tested. And similarly, um, there hasn't been great uptake in people in sort of the 20 to 39 year age group. And there is a bit of thought happening in this space about you know how to get these people um, in for testing, how to make testing more accessible for this um, demographic. Um, so we'd really welcome any suggestions on the Slido um, and also would be interested to hear, you know, the experience at the community respiratory clinics and whether, you know, these people are getting captured through other means. Um, so this is just an interesting paper that came out recently and John Ferguson may wish to speak to some of these issues later, but um, just referring to the sensitivity of PCR um, and it's demonstrating that the likelihood of a test being positive in someone who truly has SARS-CoV-2 um, is quite related to the timing of their illness. And so you can see if a swab is taken, you know, five days before somebody's illness onset in someone who is actually incubating the disease, 
there's sort of a 100% chance that that swab will be falsely negative. Um, but even when you take the swab on the date of onset of symptoms, there is still, um, uh, here it's sort of showing a 30% chance that the swab may still be negative. So this is sort of what we're thinking about as the false negative rate of swabs. Now, I mean, we're talking about a really, really low pretest probability with the current um, with the current picture in Australia. So the chance that someone actually has SARS-CoV-2 is very, very low, um, but just something to be mindful of in terms of um, you know test performance. So there have been some in-depth reviews looking at at swabs, um, and so this was uh, swabs that are tested by the um, reverse transcriptase PCR methodology. So just, just some interesting evidence there. And I guess that brings me back to our most recent case that we've had notified. So there was a change to the case definition, I think it was about a week ago, to include um, serology as a potential way of diagnosing people with COVID-19. And this was a really interesting case of somebody that had had exposure to people that were unwell, so unwell travellers way back in March. They'd had a clinically compatible illness but they hadn't actually sought testing until the beginning of April. Um, so we're talking about a month after resolution of symptoms. Their PCR was negative, but they also had um, bloods collected at the time and serology came back positive. Although you will note that that was several weeks later. And serology is a, a method that's just been developed at Westmead. There are obviously a lot of commercial assays out there, um, which are sort of a varying performance. But, um, but Westmead do have reasonable confidence now in the performance of their serological assay and um, and we believe that the results will be coming through in a more timely manner. So just to make the audience aware, um, it's not really useful for an acute diagnosis, but if you know there are scenarios where somebody has had this kind of story of you know being a contact of a confirmed case um, and having an illness but a long time ago that you could potentially consider serology in that setting. So I think I will leave it there and pass over to Catherine for the Central Coast update. Thanks, Kat. Um, oh. Uh, so I haven't prepared any slides because I did want to keep it brief, but I thought I would just give uh, an update on the situation in the Central Coast. Um, so at the moment, we're sitting on 117 cases, um, uh, and that is uh, the same number we've been sitting on for a while, but we have actually a case notified in the last two weeks uh, and one case that had originally been assigned to our area, uh, leave the area, so that's why the numbers haven't changed. Um, interestingly, similarly to the case Kath, Kat just discussed, our most recent case that was diagnosed in the last two weeks um, actually had symptom onset almost a month ago uh, and was a, a, a close contact of a confirmed case um, but had symptoms persisting for a number of weeks and so underwent um, testing which came back positive um, and then we also did serology on this person to try and uh, clarify when we thought their onset was and they had a positive serology test which was very suggestive that the illness onset a month ago actually corresponded to um, the time they probably contracted COVID and the time they had contact with the confirmed case um, and it, so it was very interesting that they remained persistently PCR positive four weeks later um, and was quite lucky they presented the swabbing um, and it sort of reinforced to us that there probably are um, and have been and may continue to be people in the community that weren't picked up previously. So the chance of um, cases occurring is now very small, but still definitely not zero. Um, so of our 117 cases, as of yesterday, um, all of our active cases have recovered. And so 116 of our cases have recovered and we did have one death, but that was in an elderly patient with comorbidities who never actually displayed any symptoms of coronavirus, um, but uh, d d we believe actually died uh, due to their comorbidities and died with rather than of coronavirus. Um, so certainly our experience on the coast in terms of um, severity of illness, uh, our, our, our residents, despite our older skewing population have done quite well, um, which is a, a very nice to see. Um, so we're done um, as of today, about 15,500 tests. Um, 
so that gives us a rate across the coast of about 40 per thousand population with it, which is an excellent um, number it shows a, a you know four percent of central coast residents have presented for a test um, which is great um, the numbers similarly again to cat uh, we are seeing a, a, a more skew towards women getting tested whether that represents health seeking behaviour or a higher number of healthcare workers being women is unclear, but I do think perhaps uh, women more than men are more likely to present for testing. Uh, we also seeing that children, particularly school age children, are a little bit underrepresented in our test numbers. Um, so that's something that we're looking at locally and we're going to try and make it um, uh, testing more accessible for children. Currently our COVID clinic doesn't test children under 10 uh, but that's something that we're looking at because particularly with schools going back we want to make testing for children as accessible as possible. Um, currently at the moment we're in this lull um, we're hoping it can represents um, that you know the end of the significant workload that we face rather than just a lull in between peaks um, but just to be on the safe side we're focusing a lot on our system preparedness and ability to intensively uh, contact trace and follow up any confirmed cases that we may get um, to ensure we don't get any ongoing spread. Um, and we've also been working uh, quite hard on uh, supporting Sandy Vincent to develop the Central Coast specific health pathway, um, which I believe uh, is imminently to be released. Um, so I will leave it there, but happy to answer any questions at the end. Thanks. Right, okay, thanks everybody. I'll, I'll take over from here. I'm just going to give you a bit of a potpourri of uh, recent stuff and I won't labour the point over infection control as I've done in the past. Uh, so this was a, quite a signature paper from Nature Medicine that looked at temporal dynamics of viral shedding and transmissibility. And I guess there'd been a lot of debate about whether those asymptomatic carriers were transmitting or not. And this paper sort of really uh, nailed it to some degree. It looked at 77 infector infectee transmission pairs and looked at their viral loads uh, from symptom onset and prior to symptom onset. And um, they estimated 44% of secondary cases were infected during the index case pre symptomatic stage in settings with substantial household clustering, etc. So, this has underpinned a movement of uh, tracing to go back 48 hours prior to symptom onset. In, in epi terms. So these... Uh, so this is, these are some very busy plots, but uh, really the central th issue from this is to look at the solid lines that are declining as the onset, from the onset of illness on the, on the zero point. And the red and blue lines distinguish severe from non-severe cases and really showing that, A, the viral load is highest from zero to five days of the illness, and secondly, that severe and non-severe presentations have an equivalent viral load. Um, so that's interesting data from there. So this is another set of plots uh, which is quite complicated. On the right, we have the situation with the SARS 2003 virus and the seasonal influenza virus. With SARS 2003, we had fairly delayed significant viral load, so that the, uh, um, w this made the disease easier to control because there wasn't this pre-symptomatic spread of the disease occurring in most parts. Whereas influenza is, is more like this current virus, there's a pre-symptomatic phase to, pre to uh, spread. And uh, in a sense, uh, so, so this virus is more akin to influenza. This, this paper then is able to then distinguish the incubation period from the serial interval, the serial interval being the interval between symptomatic cases, and that in this virus is actually less than the incubation period. Uh, I hope I've got that right. Um, next to a, a very medical uh, reference from Twitter, uh, where everybody goes for their literature these days, uh, this is from a physician who spent quite a deal of time summarising 14 different studies on transmission dynamics and um, I'll go to her summaries in, in a moment but one of the studies was a very large series of case reports from China, non-Hubei province and 318 outbreaks with three or more cases in them 
so they had case reports of each of these clusters and involving 1,245 cases, 80% of them involving three or four cases. Now, when they examined these, 80% of them came from home, household transmission clusters and 34% from transportation, so cars, public transport, uh, and taxis and the like. And there was only a single cluster that occurred in an outdoor environment. I think that was someone in conversation uh, fairly close quarters in an outdoor environment. So that's interesting data, isn't it? And that's, that's been uh, really under, underpinned by a lot of other data that uh, um, Dr. Sevig quotes. Um, and uh, I, I think you've probably read her slide by now. Um, but uh, these high infection rates, particularly in households and closed gatherings, are the key here. And I think this really then will inform our approach to um, isolation and, and uh, control in future. Um, and um, growing evidence suggests children are less susceptible are and are infrequently responsible for household transmission. So there's some, some good data showing that children are, are usually not the index case within a household. Uh, it's usually an adult. This is in great uh, comparison to, say, to influenza, where the children play a big role. And uh, transmission most likely in the first five days of symptoms. Well, we've seen that viral load information, so that tabs in with that. Now, she had some nice take-homes about redesigning our living and working spaces. And I think increasingly, and, and uh, avoiding close sustained contact indoors and in public transportation, etc. So this is the new normal for us, if you like. And I'll just flash up Craig Dalton, our local star um, paper. This, this is his paper looking at what the new normal might look at, look, look like, um, suggesting a range of things that are low cost that we could go on doing. And I think it's worth studying. The White House studied this paper and, uh, and flagged it at a briefing. Um, Fauci actually quoted uh, Craig's preprint of this paper. Um, so that's interesting, isn't it? But uh, that's worth a read. We can distribute it. It's just in a, a recent MJA. So what about infection prevention control? So contact and droplet precautions remain the mainstay. And I guess our message to our healthcare staff is around eye protection, particularly because they're neglecting that. They tend to neglect the eye protection. We have a single case of a Chinese physician who developed conjunctivitis when not using eye protection and then went on to get COVID uh, systemic infection. And that's about the only data I've got. We had airborne protections for high risk aerosol generating procedures. So those are generally things like non-invasive ventilation, intubation, high flow nasal oxygen. Uh, there's just a range of things there. We, we know that fine particle aerosols come from a lot of other activities like coughing and sneezing and breathing, but the information seems to show that there's no evidence of transmission at, at a distance, as would, say, happen with measles. There is a useful document. I think it's useful because I sit on the ICAG now. Uh, um, that'll be available probably at the end of the week. We can distribute that. It sort of really uh, teases out the evidence for you about transmission modes. And I guess it's not to say that there's not opportunistic airborne spread, but it's, it seems to be very, very fine print with this virus. Still no published data. Um, so this is just a, as, a, as a laugh. If you like, the, there have been a number of episodes of choir singing that have led to clusters of COVID-19. Uh, there's still quite some dispute as to whether this involves aerosol production or not. Clearly, aerosols are being produced, but uh, the, there's a, a German scientist who's studied this particular outbreak in Amsterdam where uh, I think 60 or 100 choir choristers uh, became infected and uh, maintains that the aerosol production from singing is actually not that considerable. Um, he's more worried about flautists and uh, oboes. <laughs> but um, this is uh, Dr. Kehler. So Sorry? Violinists Yes, well, I think it's got to do with the, the um, composition as well. If you, you sing rubbish music, you... No, actually, they're singing Bach, so I can't talk about that. <laughs> And here's a, here's a typical scenario from a, from a restaurant, uh, uh, a large restaurant. They had about um, 100 guests staying two hours over lunch and uh, staff. And 
there was an A1, the index case was asymptomatic with COVID-19 and over that two hours uh, there were nine other people that got it and it was only in this corner of the restaurant where that case was. So uh, again, against an aerosol production, aerosols would have infected everybody in that uh, restaurant in two hours if, if it was fine particle aerosol. So presumably the infectious dose carried by those aerosols is not sufficient. Desiccation removes the viability of the virus probably as well. And there's a di dilutional effect with distance uh, of, of spread away from the index case. What about serological testing? So this is still extremely problematic. There are a lot of dodgy serological assays out there that are being pushed big time on LMICs in, uh, that I hear, hear about. And I think Australia bought some dodgy ones recently. Um, so really the serological response doesn't come in until the second week of illness. And then you're dealing with the sensitivity of the different assays and whether they've been validated effectively to, to work out whether they're going to give false positives, false negatives from lack of sensitivity, etc. So they're not a diagnostic uh, measure in the acute illness and PCR remains the mainstay there. Antigen tests really haven't come in either. They've performed very poorly. Uh, but again, we're at first generation with antigen assays. So, um, and 6% of uh, people in, in at least this study sh didn't produce an antibody response at all. Uh, so that's a little bit worrying, um, but clearly an issue with serological testing, so not to be recommended. Is there long-term immunity? Too early to tell. Uh, we, we believe that there should be, that this virus doesn't mutate as quickly as the influenza virus and escape immunity. There's no creditable reports of second infections. There's this problem of uh, PCR positivity waxing and away, you know, coming and going because of the uh, issue of specimen collection, particularly at viral loads, low viral loads. So um, that probably explains some of the recrudescence of PCR positivity. Um, so this is a slide from MedCram, which actually I quite like. It uh, has daily updates on literature and, and it's very well discussed by um, a US uh, pulmonologist, infectious disease specialist. Uh, he was highlighting here the risk factors for progression to respiratory failure. And they, we see a very ferocious immune response with um, uh, um, thrombogenic immune response, endothelial damage, high D-dimer, high ferritin, high CRP, and, and all of these factors are distinct risk factors. So if you have a, a D-dimer in that territory, you have a likelihood of mortality of more than tenfold, or I think it's 18-fold, in fact. So really, you, you know what uh, President Trump doesn't know. There really is nothing out there yet to point a stick at. The remdesivir story is still to be told. The American trial has still not been published even in, as a preprint. Uh, the Lancet published uh, other trial really uh, failed to show that this was a heart-stopping uh, therapy. Um, innate immunity. So to our north, we've got PNG with still only eight cases. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but uh, that's a highly BCG uh, vaccinated population. And we know BCG um, augments your innate immunity, which is an important factor with this virus. Thrombosis from endothelial damage, very much a problem in intensive care cases. So we see things like pulmonary infarction and other deep vein thrombosis occurring. And the issue of oxidative stress uh, is, is a big one. So uh, this is particularly driven by angiotensin when it, can't, uh, when it uh, goes to its receptor. So it's one of the drivers of thrombogenesis and the oxidative stress. And there's sort of, there are trial, trials now looking at um, things like N-acetylcysteine as a way of offering the uh, glutathione system for dealing with antioxidant uh, uh, stress in the body. So that might be something that comes out soon. Um, I, this is uh, just really highlighting the, the thrombogenic damage and the release of von Willibrand Willy Willy brand factor that drives a lot of this uh, uh, thrombosis um, and um, I think there's still a lot to be done there in countering that. Uh, we're not actually anticoagulating these patients uh, as a routine. They do get heparin prophylaxis uh, and 
but we've got to have a very low index of suspicion for diagnosing, diagnosing thrombosis. So that's your lot today. I look forward to your questions. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much, John. Um, that's always very enlightening when we hear your pearls of wisdom. Um, so I thank you very much for this opportunity to update you on what's happening in Health Pathways, both on the Central Coast and here in Hunter, New England. Um, we still have our initial assessment and management pathway and ongoing ma man assessment and management pathway and aged care pathways, and Central Coast will very soon have their ongoing pathway live and ready to go. In the wings, we have a paediatric pathway and a palliative care pathway coming. So they're our clinical pathways. And I'm just going to jump down here and um, talk you through a few things that are going on. So with the initial assessment, um, whoops, just sign in again. With the initial assessment and management pathway, you'll note at the top that there is a clinical editor's note. And that's where you'll find, you know, um, some late breaking new information. Um, in there tomorrow morning you will see the details of a new Cessnock pop-up clinic uh, that we found out about late tonight that should be going up overnight ready for tomorrow. Um, also on this page we have worked very closely with our Aboriginal health unit and public health unit to add some uh, specific Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander information and you'll find that here under the assessment section mm -hmm. and then there's a very large um, section down under management, um, which I hope uh, all of you who are working with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mm -hmm. patients will find useful. Um, also, we've updated the medication management section, um, made it a little bit briefer and put some really interesting links in just to give you a bit more information about some of the things that John was talking about and some of the things you might be a bit more interested in. Um, we've also done a bit of work in the telehealth space. If you go down to the telehealth pathway, um, we've added a brand new pathway which you can link to from the um, assessment six around uh, providing telehealth consultations for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And once again, we have worked very closely with the Aboriginal health unit and, and the public health unit to make sure that that is accurate, correct, um, culturally sensitive and something that should be useful for all our clinicians. I just want to highlight a few things on the referral page as well because um, some people have fed back that um, they, they find some things a little bit difficult to find. Um, and also want to say a very big thank you to all of those who have uh, sent feedback in. We find it very useful and it really does help us improve the quality of our pages. You'll find all the information about testing under the testing tab. Um, and also up in the clinical editor's note um, on that hyperlink there is a list of all the private pathology collection centres. And that is updated weekly. We have also been working on a list that is specific for aged care facilities um, and that should be going live hopefully tomorrow and that includes um, pathology companies that will go into an aged care facility not only to test for COVID but also to test for all your other pathology requirements as well and that will sit here on this referral page as well as the aged care facility um, assessment and management page. Um, but here under point three this is where you'll find all the testing centres both the private ones and also the public ones. So that's where our community respiratory clinic sit um, that you've been hearing about tonight, as well as the Hunter New England testing centres. And if there are any that don't appear here, you can just click on this New South Wales Health COVID-19 clinic and you'll find a full list in there. But the thing we added today that um, GPs might find interesting is that uh, we were given a number today that GPs can ring to find out the results of any tests that they haven't got the results for yet. Um, and also the information around um, patients being able to access their results by SMS. Um, and then the other thing I just want to point out about aged care facilities is um, that the Australian government has engaged Sonic uh, Pathology to come in and do rapid testing in aged care facilities and the details are there on that link as well. Um, and then the only other thing to point out is that, as always, we've got our patient info site, which is our companion site that's not password protected that you can direct your patients to. And we've got two feature topics on there. We've got the COVID-19 information topic and the mental health supports for COVID-19 topic. Um, and if you were to want 
any cards to give to your patients. All you need to do is click the feedback button and let us know what you want and where to send them and we will get them out to you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, it was, so um, John's just asked me to mention the Central Coast Pathways. Um, so on the Central Coast, we've got um, the same initial assessment and management pathway that we have because that's a state-based pathway, so the whole of New South Wales has that. Um, they've also got the practice management pathway, the telehealth pathway, very soon an ongoing assessment and management pathway. They do have the aged care facility pathway um, and, yeah. Oh, and, and the testing sites will appear on the referral page. Great. Thanks for that update, Sandra. So I think we're now um, past the formal presentations for the evening, but we'll move into um, a bit of a panel discussion on the on your questions that are coming through Slido. So I'll try and keep track of this and direct these um, where appropriate, but feel free to handball or take things on notice. Um, so we'll just start from the top. Uh, we've got a question here from Anita Watts. Do we know if there's evidence to support temperature screening of patients presenting to general practice as a way to protect other patients and staff? Um, I might start off with my own experience and then maybe see what you think, John. But um, I mean, temperature screening is fraught in the sense that uh, there, I mean, in terms of the percentage of people that have a fever that have COVID-19, so the sensitivity of temperature screening, um, it, you know, it's probably less than 50%. Um, and then when you add in, you know, the possibly 80% of people that have, you know, mild or asymptomatic disease, it's, it's probably lower again. So, um, you know, fever, while it's a common symptom of COVID-19, is um, certainly not particularly sensitive, nor is it specific. Um, having said that, uh, there is a role for entry screening in workplaces. So, um, in Hunter New England Local Health District, for example, there is entry screening happening at all um, facilities and it's happening at the public health unit as well. And it's been really interesting in the sense that, I mean, there are questions asked in terms of whether people have respiratory symptoms or a fever, um, which then, you know, prompts if people answer yes to that, that they get sent for a COVID test and told to isolate until they get the results back. Um, and I think that as a process in itself has um, done two things. I mean, it's obviously helped people to take the advice on physical hygiene seriously um, and workplace safety seriously, but it's also helped people to feel safer coming into the workplace. And so, um, you know, while the evidence might not be great of um, its ability to kind of stop people from coming through that might have COVID-19, um, there, there are arguments for it in terms of, I suppose, raise, raising the profile of this new normal that we live under in terms of you know, physical distancing and being mindful of, of enhanced hygiene measures. Um, and uh, yeah, and I mean, it, it also helps um, staff and patients feel, feel protected to some degree. So I'm interested in other thoughts. I totally agree with you. I, th I think the other thing is it prompts people to clean their hands on, on entry, yes. which is yes. great. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're entry screening at our clinic and we acknowledge all of those things about its limitations. I figure it's better than not doing anything at all. And uh, again, that confidence building, that yes, we're doing something, we're taking this seriously, um, and this is a place we're doing everything we can. So I mean, if you're worried. Great, okay. Um, so uh, there's a question from Phil Godden. Do you think it is safe on the Central Coast for us to be doing home visits, nurses and doctors for health assessments, etc.? I'm not sure if we're technically capable. Oh, Todd, yes, he's nodding. We'll flick back to Catherine on this one. Hi. Um, so I would, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> I would certainly say that at the moment, um, it would be very safe. We don't appear to have any locally acquired cases for a number of um, weeks now. Uh, and the one recent case we did have was an old case, um, but I would still, so we're in our local health district continuing to do our home visits, um, but there is a pre-screening process where patients are contacted by phone um, just to get a, a better idea of their symptoms so you don't get a surprise. Obviously, you know you're going to see someone with an upper respiratory tract infection. You can take all the appropriate PPE. Um, but, yeah, just uh, so our home visiting nurses are doing that pre-screening process just to make sure that they don't get any surprises. But I would say that at the moment um, it, 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 it doesn't pose a significant risk of encountering someone with um, occult COVID. 
Thanks, Catherine. Um, and certainly that's uh, also the situation in Hunter, New England. Um, the next question is from Kim Isaac about recommendations in terms of PPE for general face-to-face -face appointments. So this is a biggie and, um, and I suppose a related point that we've had on that um, is that you know, while there's been revised advice in terms of the need for gowns, for example, which are in very short supply during specimen collection, um, there's still a, a recommendation that, you know, contact and droplet precautions be used for anyone with, you know, for a consult with anybody with suspected COVID-19. Um, and then we get into all of these sort of circular discussions about, you know, what's a suspected case definition and what's a testing definition. Um, so uh, I might throw to you on that one, John. Oh, look, I think it's back to standard precautions and, and a better understanding of that so that, you know, assume you don't know what anybody has and if you're going to examine a throat, whatever their symptom status, you wear eye protection and a surgical mask. Um, you know, if you're going to take down a wound, you put gloves on. If, if you need to protect your, your gear from contact with pathogens, viral or bacterial, you wear an apron or, or, and, and bear, bear below the elbow. Um, and hand hygiene. So hand hygiene and standard precautions really provide droplet and contact protection if, if practiced properly. So it's this having a risk assessment model of using PPE as appropriate and not, not so much thinking what the patient has, but assuming that they're, they're potentially uh, transmitting infection. I don't know. Um, yeah. A question for you, John. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, my own personal practice when we're doing face-to-face -face and we're seeing about 60% face-to-face -face consults mm. while well, I have been in my own personal uh, sessions. So I um, hand hygiene after every patient contact and after every consult before I bring the next patient in. Um, I have been wearing a mask um, for consulting the patient on the premise that I've been working in a, in a COVID clinic and if I'm pre-symptomatic and I've caught COVID, the last thing I would like to yes. be transmitting it to my patient. Some patients look at it with a bit of alarm and I sort of say to them, well, this is actually for your protection. I don't think I've got anything but I'd like to be sure that I'm not going to give anything to you. Is that a reasonable approach? Yes, well, that's, that's another function of a mask, clearly to contain someone's respiratory yeah, droplets, and that, yeah. that is shown to work. Um, I, th I think given the lack of community transmission, we, we don't need to wear a mask generally mm -hmm. for, for protecting ourselves from our patients. Um, but um, I still find that many doctors, maybe not in general practice land, don't understand standard precautions properly. And that's, that's the opportunity here to make that the new normal, I think. Um, and I think there are things for our elderly patients in particular, that, we, that for, in our practice we've been asking our doctors and our nurses when they're doing face-to-face um, -face consults, just, just to be level, a level two mask is fine for, yes. for doing that. So we've actually, the ones that are at risk themselves are the ones that are not wanting to see face-to-face, -face, and we're saying, sure, you can use a higher level, level three, but for protecting that, particularly the elderly patients, we've been pretty well encouraging our doctors to wear masks with patient contact. Yeah, so the levels of the masks relate to their splash resistance. And really a level one mask is going to be quite sufficient for, for um, preventing droplets from getting to your nose or mouth. Um, and I presume you're not getting big blood, blood or fluid splashes in the face. Uh, so you don't really need to worry too much about the level of mask, the surgical mask. And John, do you mind just uh, providing a little bit of comment around the gown uh, question? Yes, so the gown question is, is really a minor part of the equation. Um, intact skin is not, we don't need to worry about viral transmission. Um, yes, your, your gear will get contaminated. And I think it's more, more along the lines of having a routine when you get home to get out of your gear and perhaps have a shower if you've, you've been doing things all day. Just, just that, that could be a new normal for you. And I think that gives you a added assurance that you're not bringing anything home. I, I think really gowns have usually been about preventing splash. Again, um, blood and body substance from splashing on you, not so much droplets. Uh, this, this out of Ebola has come this concern of, of droplets uh, contamination with, with virus onto materials, but I, I don't see any good evidence that the gown is an important part of the equation in protecting people. It's the mask and eye protection at the front and central and the hand hygiene. Yep. Mm. Certainly we've had the adoption of scrubs at, at our practice, so yeah. with all our clinical staff are wearing scrubs now. 
Yes, yeah, so I do. I wear scrubs. And I think uh, often an apron, a plastic apron, is as useful as a, as a gown, particularly if you're bare below the elbow, you can avoid uh, contaminating your scrubs adequately with an apron because that's, that's what you're coming up against the patient usually. Mm. Yeah, it comes to that risk-based assessment as well, mm. those standard precautions and then risk-based assessment. Yes, yeah, so it's quite acceptable to wear an apron as part of contact precautions, yeah. Mm. All right, good discussion. Um, the next question is, uh, I think Sandra's addressed this about the public health arrangement to provide COVID, COVID swabbing in nursing homes. So um, just to flesh out the arrangement, um, as Sandra mentioned, the, the DHM has been contracted by the Commonwealth to do this. Um, obviously, you know, when a, when a case is notified in an aged care facility, that triggers off a lot of notification processes with public health unit also up to the Commonwealth um, and the uh, relevant agencies. Um, and uh, my understanding is that the, the deployment of that swabbing happens essentially automatically. I don't think public health even needs to arrange it. Um, there's still some detail being worked out in terms of um, whether that swabbing is going to include other pathogens such as influenza, because obviously that will change the management of an aged care facility outbreak. Um, but yep, so there is an arrangement in place. It's yet to be tested um, in our region, but, but yes, it does exist and GPs don't need to, to trigger it themselves. Uh, the next question from Joe: can GPs order serology through Westmead? That's a good question. Um, over the past month or so, public health, I mean, the, the serology has been quite tightly controlled. Um, there's been a lot of quality assurance processes that have been happening at Westmead and Westmead have also been performing a lot of validation of um, a number of these quite rubbishy tests that John <laughs> referred to. So um, uh, Westmead have been sort of leading the way in terms of, of their serological assay in New South Wales. Um, and previously public health have had to, on a case by case basis, um, request serology and request approval for serology through Westmead. But our understanding is that this is now um, uh, opening up somewhat. Uh, as John mentioned, there's not really a, an acute diagnostic value to serology um, and it's more of a sort of public health and epidemiological investigative tool. So I would suggest maybe uh, for the time being that perhaps you just consult with the public health unit, give us a call and, and we can talk you through it and talk through the case with you. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's much more accessible now and uh, the way that you would get that arranged is probably just by sending the, the blood sample through Pathology North. Good, okay. Um, how many people locally have the COVID Safe app? <laughs> I suppose that's a question for me. Um, I don't actually know. Uh, that's sort of been managed at a, at a Commonwealth level. And you may have also heard some recent media in terms of, uh, I guess, teething problems with states being able to access data, but we've had very low case numbers, so haven't really been able to, to test out the, <laughs> the utility of it. So I, I don't think I can answer that question on the spot. Um, but, but yes, I mean, it's, it's really just enhancing the, I mean, I can talk through briefly what the COVID Safe app does. Um, so it works via Bluetooth. Um, there's no location data collected by the app. And so essentially when two people have the app on their phones and they're proximal to each other, so um, you know, within Bluetooth radius, um, and their phones will sort of talk to each other once a minute. And if the phones talk to each other for more than 15 minutes, um, then the, the numbers get exchanged. That um, data is then stored on the user's phone. And then should that person become diagnosed with COVID-19, uh, then public health at their initial interview with that person will ask them if they have the app and if they give permission for their phone's data to be downloaded. And then that will produce a list of all the phone numbers of people that have had that Bluetooth connection with um, the person. And then it's public health's job to go and ring through the list. So <laughs> that's my understanding of, of how it works. And so, I mean, it's probably, um, you know, not going to create any light bulb moments necessarily. It's probably going to generate quite a bit of work for, for public health units, but it will give a list of numbers uh, which public health will then um, go on to call people. Yes. So could I ask, uh, uh, when, when I go to a restaurant in future, am I going to be asked at the door to show, show that my app is on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh, that's a political question, John. <laughs> oh, I see. But surely that, that makes sense, doesn't it? If, if, if mm. we're going to go to closed environments with other people. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. the other thing that may, may make sense in that context is, you know, restaurants keeping good registers of, of all the people that have oh, been there yeah. at the time. So, yes. Mm. But yes, good thinking. All right, I'll move on. Um, so, Wyong Hospital, so there's just a couple of comments about the um, Central Coast testing clinics. I might leave those ones offline. Oh, yep. Awesome. Yep, beautiful. Okay. Um, question from Catherine. What advice would you give to a teacher with type 1 diabetes returning to work in the classroom? Oh, well, look, uh, diabetes has been a risk factor for severe disease in, in older age groups, certainly. Um, I think that the absolute risk of her, her being exposed to COVID from a child is, is very, very low. So um, I guess the usual things about social distancing and, and physical distancing and ha hygiene at work apply, don't they? Um, and, you know, you, I, the data out of China failed really to show that schools or um, classrooms were hotbeds of infection. There, there were no outbreaks or clusters associated with the classrooms. And that's been the case in Australia, large terms, hasn't it? So, uh, in relative terms, they're probably safer than being in a restaurant. This is true. Um, and certainly there has been work undertaken in the New South Wales context, so the National Centre for uh, Immunisation Research and Surveillance, NCIRS, um, has been working closely with New South Wales Health because there has been such interest in, I suppose, the, the school environment. Um, so they've, you know, looked at settings uh, where there's been a case diagnosed in a school and then there's been intensive follow-up work to actually screen everybody within that school environment that are, that are close contacts. Um, and there's been, you know, very, very minimal transmission documented from, from that if investigation. Any. Been maybe two or three cases. Yeah. I don't have the data to hand, but um, mm. we can certainly circulate those papers from from NCIRS. Um, okay, so uh, this might be a question for Damien. Um, can you tell me if clinics are bringing patients into waiting rooms, socially distanced, or waiting outside, or in their car? This is. Oh, I can I can variable. certainly speak about what happens mm. in Raymond Terrace. So um, we've got two very distinct. Um, practices really with the general Raymond Terrace family practice and the Raymond Terrace Respiratory Clinic. Uh, in, the re in the respiratory clinic patients uh, wait in their car. We've actually got a really large window in an office where we can see the car and we can actually talk to them on the phone. Um, you know, it's surprisingly uh, useful. Uh, so we do all of the history taking phase of our consultation over the telephone with line of sight to them there um, and then uh, bring them inside for just the uh, physical examination phase and swab collection only, so they're literally in the room for just a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. just to minimise contact time in the room. Um, that clinic also has, uh, courtesy of Hunter New England Health, a fantastic bus shelter outside with a couple of bench seats to provide somewhere to sit if you arrive other than by car. Um, at the other end of the building, this is probably yeah. over to Sarah. Cause some well, we've actually, um, so we have, particularly at the beginning, we had everybody um, contacted in the car, so waited in the car until the doctor spoke to them. Um, at the moment, we've got a Hunter New England screening, so the temperature screening stations, they come in. Um, so the ones that are coming through, we organise beforehand whether or not they come through, and we try to get them to come through slowly, so we come only one, so if we're running late, so Damien and I tend to not be great on time management. The, um, the girls only get them to come through um, just for a, f a few minutes before they need to, otherwise we call them. So we actually are trying to minimise the amount of time in our waiting rooms. We've marked off um, the chairs so that we've got socially distanced chairs because it's quite a big waiting room. Um, and then we have got a sub weight area as well where we can bring people through. But again, we've taken away chairs so that they can't actually sit. So we're trying to closely control who comes in and how they come in. That's great to hear um, those practical tips. Okay, um, so a uh, question about PPE, which we might um, take on notice for the PHN. Um, and another one for Damien and Sarah about how many cases or COVID cases or tests, I'm not sure, have you seen at the clinic? 
So that's one for me. Um, I can tell you we haven't had any positive results yet, and that sort of fits with you know, what's been going on the last... We've been open for five, five weeks. weeks. Yeah. Um, I would have to have a stab at the number of tests that we've done. It's been, I'd say, somewhere between seven and 800 tests by now. We're testing a broad demographic. Um, I know that you asked earlier um, what do our numbers look like. I've, I've done a fair proportion of the shifts in the clinical, are handing it more over to others. Um, but we've tested a number of babies, up to five. Um, then there'll be a gap. I can't personally think of anybody between the age of about five or between five and about 20 that, that's had a test. It's maybe it's occasional in yeah. the high teens. Yeah. And then quite a lot of young adults and uh, right through, I, I, would, I don't think there'd be any one age group except maybe the 60 to 80 seems to be a very worried group and they come for testing with minimal symptoms. Uh, and uh, as your graph showed earlier, a uh, predominance of females, probably nearly two to one, mm. across, or mm. right across the whole range of ages. Kat, um, we've been, John Bailey here, we've been advised in the last couple of days that we will have access to de-identified data from each of the respiratory clinics at a PHN level. Mm -hmm. So our intention is once that we've got some volume there, we will do an infographic similar to what you've done uh, for the clinics so that they can see what they've done, how they've done it, add the profiles, etc. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Um, the, oh, I just have a brief question for you. Um, which lab are you using and what's your turnaround time? <laughs> We're using uh, New South Wales Health Pathology until mm -hmm. um, yesterday. And the turnaround time's been excellent, it's been 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, we consistently had difficulty sourcing enough swabs. Mm -hmm. um, and on a couple of occasions, we got, or on one occasion, we got down to four swabs remaining, 18 people booked in for the afternoon. And then the courier arrived with another 30 swabs, which saw us for the afternoon and half of the morning session the next day. Yeah. And every few days we were, we were begging for more swabs. So we've just pivoted to DHM. They delivered us 300 swabs on Friday and they brought us another 200 today. And their turnaround time has also been from one day of experience, 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. The swabs mostly come from Copan in northern Italy. Yeah. <laughs> but I understand Copan has continued its exports uh, of swabs uh, through through the um, Yeah, well, and we've got problem there, some... But there's been such a worldwide demand. Swabs we've got now are a little inferior to what we had before. We had some nice bendy ones that were easy to get in the nose. Now we've got quite thick, rigid ones, which uh, patients aren't enjoying the experience so of having their nose swabbed at all. We've gone against doing nasopharyngeal swabs now, so just a deep nasal swab and using a single swab mm -hmm. for the throat and then yeah. the nose uh, is, is the PHLM advice now. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm not sure when we're supposed to wrap up. We can, okay, well, there's a couple of good ones, maybe two more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so there was one that got bumped up and I missed it, but if the test false negativity is high, then what do we do about clearance for childcare, healthcare workers, et cetera? Um, it's a good question. And I mean, there was, I suppose, you know, in the beginning, there was a lot of nervousness about, you know, this whole process of doing clearance swabbing. And that's why we rely on things like the 14 day quarantine for people who have been exposed or, you know, have a potential epidemiological link. Um, and even if those people test negative, we still ask um, them to isolate. But, you know, in this current climate of, I suppose, you know, less clear epi links, it's, it's difficult to, to say what the role of, of swabbing would necessarily be. Um, I mean, in high risk settings, uh, you know, when there are people requiring swabbing, so these are confirmed cases, requiring swabbing to be cleared to go back into those settings. Um, the fact that they need two consecutive PCRs at least 24 hours apart should give um, some, I suppose, should bolster the, the sensitivity of that test. Yeah, look, I guess in the first five days of illness, the false negative rate is probably 3%, if that. You know, it, it, all those data are highly dependent on the type of samples that they've taken and whether the quality of the sample. But, um, so it's really not a, not a big issue. And so in the hospital, where, where we've got an initial negative test and a high pretest probability, we'll go after a second test for sure. Um, uh, to, to deal with that and even one of our intensive care cases we've gone for a third test from a, a deep sample, a lower respiratory tract sample because there are reported false negatives from upper respiratory tract. Yep. Kat, we've got a... um, Karen Douglas just like to make a comment. Yes, Karen. Uh, 
Thanks, everyone. Um, I guess just um, coming back to what's happening at in the grassroots general practices as well is that many of us are actually seeing our respiratory patients um, and swabbing them just in day to day practice. So I think it's really important that um, we we you know support general practice in um, that we are swabbing our own patients. Many of us um, are you know being able to triage our patients so that we can bring them in together and um, examine them and do an assessment and provide them the script or provide them the medical certificate, which sometimes we're finding, particularly on the Central Coast, doesn't happen at the swabbing clinic. So um, general practice is still just so important and we just ask you for as much support as you can for us in general practice land. Um, and remember, we are swabbing. Uh, we're using private pathology. Our turnaround is about 24 hours except for weekends. And um, we're responsible for giving our patients all of the results, which we do in person, uh, sorry, in person, over the phone. Um, we don't use text. And um, our patients are very much uh, very appreciative of it. But we're also aware that there are a number of practices across um, the PHN that have vulnerable doctors in, in them and a solo doctors may not be able to provide the swabbing. So they sometimes do need support for assisting their patients with respiratory illness. As we go forward into winter, we're going to just need to really look at the collaborative um, way of working in practice that will assist each other to do that. Nobody's stealing patients. We're just trying to help each other to provide the best care and to keep people out of hospital um, and appropriately managed with their mild to moderate disease. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Thanks for those comments. Yes, yes. Uh, I just wanted to, to back that up and, and, and echo that at, at Raymond Terrace, we're staffing our respiratory clinic with about um, a bit over half the sessions done by doctors from the practice and the other half by doctors from outside the practice. And uh, one of the ways in which we got those doctors was to phone surrounding practices and ask them to help. And they put their hand up saying, look, we recognise that we can't do that ourselves, but if we have more capacity in your practice, you'll be able to look after our patients. And so they're working collaboratively with us and it's actually a really great thing. Great, well, yeah. I think that's probably a good place to leave things. Um, thank you all for your reflections on, on what's happening out there in the field. And, um, and we look forward to, oh yes, Alison's prompting me. <laughs> Could everyone please complete their evaluations on Slido um, because it does inform uh, what these sessions look like going forwards. And we do also welcome your feedback on the information that's on Health Pathways via the feedback button. Thanks, Kat. Uh, we, that's the end of our session for tonight. I'd like to thank all of our presenters and everyone who's participated. Uh, just remind you to do the, uh, the question and answers on, on Slido. Those questions that have been asked and we haven't been able to answer in person, we will endeavour to answer over the next couple of days and provide a response to those. And also just remind you that we will have another one of these live streaming events in two weeks' time with a focus on Aboriginal health. Thank you, everyone, and good night.